Good morning. Welcome to day three of the ADA self-evaluations, transition plans, and overview of elements of PROAG. This is Victoria Beal with the Ohio LTAP Center, and I'm so pleased to have my colleague, Dr. Ron Eck, from the West Virginia LTAP Center that will be your presenter on today's webinar. Um, I see folks are ahead of the game here. They've already started saying hi or hello in the question box. Thank you for doing that. Just want to make sure that everyone knows where that's at. So if you have a second to drop me a higher hello in there, that'll be wonderful. That's the way we would ask that you please send your questions in for Ron throughout the presentation, and he'll be stopping periodically and asking me for those. And of course, if we don't get to all of them, um, I'll be sending the whole list to him after the webinar. So Ron is excellent at getting us um, answers and feedback on those questions. The other thing I wanted to mention is that in the handout section, I only have two things for you today. One is a copy of the slides that Ron will be going over, and the second one is an announcement that we had sent out through Ohio LTAP concerning our new Unmanned Aircraft Systems Awareness course. This is a UAS awareness course. This is the first of a series of trainings that we're gonna be um, launching in this area. So if you or someone you know is interested, these trainings are available at no charge on our e-learning system. We'll hopefully have the pilot licensing course out within the next week. And this course that I, we have the announcement for today gives you just a general overview of UAS and how it's used in transportation. The next um, course will be on what you need to know in order to take the pilot licensing test to be a UAS pilot. So a little off topic for what we're covering today, but just in case you're interested. Um, the last thing I'm going to do here while folks are finishing up saying hi or hello in the question box is to run a, a poll. And if you wouldn't mind, let us know in your community the, what your biggest sidewalk accessibility challenge is. You can choose from compliant curb ramps, staying at or below the maximum cross slope of 2%, um, walkway width, sidewalk driveway intersections, surface condition, including elevation differences. If you're having an issue with voting, please take your screen out of full screen mode by hitting the escape button, and then the poll should be able to record your answer. And, you know, if I was answering this question, I wouldn't say necessarily my community, but I, I think back to a trip that our family made nine years ago to Washington, D.C., and, and my husband, who's a retired chef, and was right in between his knee replacement surgeries at the time. So he was in a wheelchair. We were fortunate enough to get into the White House for a tour, but boy, that ramp leading up to the actual White House was unbelievable to push him up. It was definitely more than a 2%. I'd say it was closer to like 15%. So, um, but I got him up the ramp. Um, but, you know, I wish I'd had a level with me that day so I could have checked it out while I was there. So we have 80% of you who voted already, so I'm gonna close that poll out and I will share the results. Um, we have 44% of you who said that um, compliant curb ramps are a challenge and that's the biggest percent of the voting. 13% said staying at or below the maximum cross slope of 2%. 7% um, was walkway width, 12% was sidewalk or driveway intersections, and 24% was surface condition, including elevation differences. So I'm gonna hide those results, and then I'm gonna turn things over to Ron. Are you ready, Ron? I'm ready. Thank you, Victoria. Good morning, everyone. Those of you that have been with us before, welcome back. Uh, we're now into day three, and today we'll be, as soon as I get my slide moving here, there we go. Today we'll be talking about part of the PROAG overview. In fact, actually we're sort of at the midpoint of the class. The sessions last week dealt with self-evaluations and transition plans. Today and tomorrow we will overview PROAG and the various aspects of PROAG. But before we get into that, Victoria did share the questions from last week with me, and I think we'll get to most of them. If if we don't in the next two days, I will certainly follow up and send Victoria my responses. But there was one that I thought maybe we should hit right off the bat here. Uh, and that the question is, 
does PROAG address how to determine if sidewalks are required in a particular neighborhood? And actually, PROAG does not require us to install sidewalks. Obviously, they're a good thing, especially in, say, residential neighborhoods. Uh, but what PROAG does say is that if we have sidewalks or if we construct sidewalks, they have to meet the criteria of PROAG in terms of width and surface and grade and cross slope and so forth. So PROAG doesn't say a whole lot about that topic, but I did want to mention that uh, the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, AASHTO, their pedestrian guide, which I believe is 2012 is still the version we're working with until the new one comes out, hopefully soon. But that AASHTO pedestrian guide does, I think, have a good discussion of factors to consider in assessing and prioritizing the need for sidewalks. So if anybody's interested or has a need for that sort of information, I'd go to the AASHTO PED guide. So today we're going to talk about the PAR primarily and also curb ramps. And briefly, what I call ADAG versus PROAG. I think I mentioned this last week. The current law with respect to ADA is the 2010 ADA design standards, also referred to as ADAG, the Americans with Disabilities Act Accessibility Guidelines. But that PROAG is designed or intended for buildings and on site facilities. The Access Board back in 2002 issued the initial version of PROAG, the Public Rights of Way Accessibility Guidelines, which are intended to address issues in the public right of way. This has not yet been signed into law. We're still operating under the 2011 Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. But as I hopefully I emphasized last week, the DOJ, FHWA, the courts are all telling us we should be using PROAG when we're designing and building in the public right of way. And in fact, many agencies around the country, state and local, have adopted PROAG. And in fact, a local agency, which many of you are associated with, you'll actually have to use both because you have city buildings and courthouses and libraries and other public facilities like that that would fall under the ADAG but you also obviously have facilities in the public right-of-way along your streets and roadways that fall under PROAG. I did want to highlight some important differences, since I know some of you use both ADAG and PROAG, but ADAG has as its design user a person in a wheelchair, and so the design width or the minimum width is three feet, as opposed to PROAG, where the design user is a person on crutches or using braces to assist them in walking, that footprint is probably more on the order of three and a half to four feet. So PROAG will talk about a minimum width of four feet. The maximum grade, I may have mentioned this last week, in ADAG, the maximum grade of a sidewalk is 5%. In PROAG, if the sidewalk is adjacent to and follows the street grade, the street grade is the maximum grade. Also, there's some differences regarding detectable warning surfaces. In ADAG, these are optional. In PROAG, detectable warning surfaces are required at the base of curb ramps in the public right of way. And there's probably some other differences as well, but, and there are also a number of similarities, which I'll try to point out as we go through the discussion here for the next day or so. But to me, sometimes the biggest challenges are at the interface of the public right of way and private property. These are just two images that uh, probably over the last couple of years, people who have been at my classes have forwarded email to me with kind of the message help that you could see they were at the point where people were out at the job site working, but they, there are obviously some issues with respect to uh, both safety and accessibility. Let me get my pointer here. This one here on the upper uh, left, th this is obviously not the accessible entrance. Stairs are not accessible. The accessible entrance, I think, is off to the left. But clearly, there's a safety issue here because the stair height doesn't match up very well with the existing sidewalk. Here in the lower right, uh, this is a West Virginia scene from a couple years ago, 
Uh, notice we have a brand new sidewalk, actually a replacement sidewalk along the street, but now there's an issue with an accessible route into the home. And here it looks particularly critical because just from seeing this wooden ramp here, it appears that someone in that family or in that household maybe in a wheelchair or an assistive device of some sort. And so accessibility seems to be critical. And so some of these are really tough. And my advice would be, you know, make sure we, the private and public entities work together early and communicate and coordinate throughout the project to try to avoid these sorts of situations. What are the elements of accessibility? We'll talk about these over the next couple of days. We'll spend some time today talking about the PAR, the pedestrian access route in PROAG. Of course, curb ramps, and remember from last week, curb ramps are considered by the DOJ and the courts to be the basic element of accessibility, so they should be probably our top priority. Uh, detectable warnings, the truncated domes are part of the accessibility. Uh, pedestrian crossings, crosswalks are part of the PAR. Accessible pedestrian signals, APS, that's another key element of accessibility so we can communicate signal information to the blind and visually impaired. And then we can't forget maintenance and temporary traffic control, meaning sidewalk, work zones, and the alternate pedestrian access route. These are the components of the PAR under PROAG, so walkways, sidewalks multi-use trails, paved trails, shared use paths, greenways. I think someone asked about greenways last week. If they are hard surfaced and serve a transportation component, then they fall under the PAR. Uh, ramps, like a ramp, ramp section of, of walkway. Uh, curb ramps. Curb ramps are sort of a special form of ramps, but notice the flared sides of the ramps are not part of the PAR. Also, the landings at the top of the ramps are part of the PAR. Something called blended transitions, kind of another form of curb ramps. If you're not familiar with that, don't worry about it. We'll talk about that either today or next time. Crosswalks, as I mentioned, are part of the PAR. And many of you may have pedestrian overpasses and underpasses and carry pedestrians above or below street level. These must also comply with the PAR requirements in terms of grade, cross slope, width, surface condition. And then the elevators and platform lifts is referring to elevators and platform lifts in the public right of way. For example, an elevator serving a pedestrian overpass. Elevators in buildings would fall under ADAG. These are the PAR requirements and the appropriate section in uh, PROAG, and we'll look at these in more detail now, uh, but I just wanted to give you a heads up of this. These are the things we'll be talking about. So notice kind of these key elements, width and grade and cross slope and surface condition and something called protruding objects we'll be covering. So let's start with width. PROAG says the minimum continuous unobstructed clear width of the PAR shall be four feet. Notice there's a shall there, so this is a requirement. Measured from the back of the curb, so exclusive of the width of the curb. And that should be free of both permanent and temporary obstructions. As some of you may be aware, when PROAG was being developed, there was considerable debate about the width requirement. There was a set of advocates pushing for five foot minimum width, and of course, others pushing for four feet. Obviously, the four foot run one out at this point. But the truth is, probably the best, most pedestrian friendly walkway would be five feet wide. It allows two people to walk, two able bodied people to walk comfortably side by side without having one or both of them having to step off the sidewalk. It would also allow two wheelchairs to pass as well. So a number of agencies around the country, both state and local, have adopted five feet as their minimum width. In other words, they've gone sort of above and beyond 
PROAG, and that, that's fine. Some of you may have seen this depiction before. Uh, it's called the pedestrian zone system of looking at the pedestrian environment. There's really four zones here. This would be the curb face here, so the street would be out here where my cursor is. This is the curb zone, maybe a foot or so in extent. Then we have a furniture zone where you can see there's street trees or grass, buffer strip or parking meters or bike racks or benches perhaps, information kiosks, a variety of different things could be there. Then we have the pedestrian zone, the area highlighted in blue here. And then if we're in a commercial retail area, we have a frontage zone, for example, to allow for door openings. Now, sometimes people ask, well, does PROAG require a furniture zone? And no, PROAG does not. As we'll see, I think but these buffer zones or furniture zones have a lot of important uses and can help us, in, especially, for example, dealing with driveway, sidewalk, intersections. But this is not required under PROAG. What PROAG requires is that this pedestrian zone be a minimum of four feet wide and be clear of temporary and permanent obstruction. So for example, we may need to educate our downtown merchants or business people that it may not be okay to just stick a, a tent sign here or some other type of sign, for example, advertising the daily lunch special or drink special or if it's a clothing store that they really shouldn't be just rolling their racks of clothing out for a sidewalk sale and putting it in the middle of the sidewalk. We still need to make sure that we have that four foot minimum clear unobstructed width. Where the walkway is four feet, or I should say less than five feet in clear width, we have to provide five foot by five foot passing spaces at intervals of 200 feet maximum which is one reason why many agencies have gone to the five foot minimum. That way they don't have to worry about providing passing spaces. Walkway grade, that's always an issue. And remember I said earlier, ADAG, if you use ADAG for your public right of way, your maximum sidewalk grade would be 5%. But in PROAG, if the sidewalk is in the right of way, and along the road or bridge, or as some people say, serves the, the roadway or serves the street, it can follow the general parallel roadway grade, no matter how steep that might be. But where the walkway is not contained within the street or highway right of way or doesn't serve the street, the grade of the PAR then is 5% maximum. And also keep in mind that where you have a, a crosswalk, the grade of the PAR of the crosswalk is 5% maximum. So that's the street crown. So that means your street crown or cross slope can't exceed 5% maximum. And here's an example. Uh, I took this on vacation a few years ago, so I didn't have my measuring equipment with me. But here in the upper left, Actually, this sidewalk that we just see a portion of here along this arterial followed this arterial road for probably three quarters of a mile. But notice at this point, it kind of uh, takes off on a path away from the roadway to serve this. This is a multi use trail, which actually you can see here in the lower right image. So, this is a case of this sidewalk here that I'm highlighting or here in profile view does not serve this arterial street. So its maximum grade would be 5%. And I don't know, this looks pretty close. This may actually exceed 5%. Although it looks steeper here than doesn't look quite as steep from this perspective. But under PROAG, the maximum grade of this sidewalk section would be 5% because that sidewalk or that walkway does not serve the street. As you all noted in your responses, one of the key concerns is cross slope. When we're designing and building for to comply with PROAG, PROAG says the cross slope of the walkway of the PAR shall be, there's a shall again, 2% maximum. 
and there's no allowance for construction tolerance. So if your crews tell you, or if a contractor tells you, the best I can do is plus or minus a half percent, then we should be designing for one and a half percent maximum, so that when it's built, it won't the cross slope won't exceed two percent. And people ask why is that so strict? And the reason is shown here on the right, uh, the individual in the manual wheelchair. If we could get up in a drone or something overhead view and watch someone in a manual chair negotiate a steeply cross-sloped path or walkway, we'd see that they don't maintain a straight line. Their path is very kind of irregular or weaves back and forth because they're trying to maintain a straight line, but, but it's difficult to do. In fact, it's estimated that a 3% cross slope, which of course is not much more than two, a 3% cross slope requires 50% more energy to traverse it than a 2% cross slope. And if you ever get in a manual wheelchair and go out on the sidewalks, I guarantee you this is probably the first thing that you will sense or feel when you get on a sidewalk that has a cross slope much steeper than 2%. You'll see that the, the wheelchair is just sort of pulled or gravitates down to the uh, the low side of the of the sidewalk. So cross slope is important, and it can be a challenge, obviously, as you see here. Notice here we have made this these buildings or storefronts or apartments, whatever they are, accessible. But notice the cross slope is excessively steep. Where we have a flatter cross slope, notice now the uh, the storefronts or buildings may be inaccessible. So here is one possible solution. Remember, the PAR only needs to be four feet wide. So we could make a four or five, or as they say here, six foot level area at 2% cross slope, and then steepen the adjoining areas. Now this may present issues for other users, but it is one way of complying with the PROAG requirements. And I have an example here from, this is a small city in Oregon. Uh, notice 2% cross slope on the sidewalk here. That looks much wider than four feet, looks even wider than five feet. And then there is a very steeply sloped, I'm not sure how steep this is, but it looks rather steep, steeply sloped surface that goes down to another sidewalk along the uh, diagonal parking area. And uh, one thing I like about this is notice they've delineated this steep area with, it looks like stamped concrete. So it's got some texturing and some color to let people know, let pedestrians know that this is a, a different area. But still, as a safety person, this still concerns me. I mean, where I am now or where Victoria is in Ohio in the wintertime, we get many days of snow and ice and sub-freezing temperatures. So uh, I could foresee this becoming slippery in the wintertime. It may very well even be slippery in the summertime if you get rain on that. So. Uh, that's that's a concern given its steepness. So in the past, when I offer this in person, this, I show this slide to in-person classes, I get responses like someone said, well, can't we maybe uh, take out the brick here and just put this type of shrub all the way through here so that there's, so people can't even walk here? And I, that's to me, that's a good idea. There may be some maintenance involved, you know, to prune the shrubs or water them or whatever, but I like that. Uh, one time somebody said, well, couldn't I put a, an attractive metal railing here to keep people off that steep slope? And that would work too. I like that idea. Uh, one thought I had was maybe periodically, I don't know, every 100 feet or so, put in a couple or three steps with a short handrail maybe here and there. So at least give people uh, something to say hold on to that handrail if they negotiate some steps rather than step on that steeply sloped surface. So, and there's probably other solutions as well. So there's a number of ways we can uh, solve the issue. But again, remember, we want to balance accessibility with safety and, and all our other considerations, maintenance, aesthetics, all those things that we think about in a downtown environment. 
Uh, also, as some of you noted in your responses to the polling question, a major cross slope challenge is driveways. Uh, notice here the grade of the driveway becomes the cross slope on the sidewalk, and that most usually exceeds 2%. But also notice another issue is these grade breaks or flares here. And I realize this is a cartoon depiction, but it is technically accurate. If you look closely where my cursor is here, my pointer, notice the small front wheel of that wheelchair is off the ground. And that's something that we don't want to happen. Anytime one or more wheels of a manual wheelchair leaves the ground, there's the danger of that chair tipping over or flipping over. And so we want to make sure our designs are such that all four wheels of a manual chair remain on the ground at all times. And that may not be the case at driveways like this. So here's some design solutions, things to consider in design. How about this design? Notice it looks like it's four feet, probably five feet wide, uh, level cross slope but we notice we have steepened the driveway grade here and probably here. And that's one of the benefits of this buffer zone or furniture zone here is we can use that to uh, you know, steepen the driveway there. And the second bullet is my list of factors to consider when trying to develop an accessible driveway option. Certainly the width of the sidewalk, the width of the planter strip, your curb height, your available right of way, and we also shouldn't forget the design vehicle for the driveway. So this, to me, this driveway looks like uh, passenger cars and SUVs and pickup trucks probably can negotiate that with no difficulty. But I think we've all seen those the trucks that deliver soft drinks and beer to convenience stores and supermarkets and restaurants and such. They're fairly long wheelbase and relatively low ground clearance. So depending on the driveway profile, they could high center or drag at this location. So that's why I say as part of our design, we also have to consider the, the design vehicle using the driveway. Uh, I don't know where this is. Someone sent this to me, but it, to me it's sort of sad because it looks like a brand new driveway and I'm not sure what the driveway is serving. Uh, maybe there's going to be more development here, but the point is notice this is the driveway is at a 7% grade, which means this section of sidewalk has a 7% cross slope. So this is now an inaccessible section of sidewalk, but to, to me really should not have been allowed or permitted in the, in the first place. Now, this will need to be put on the agency's transition plan as, a, as an obstacle or barrier section. But uh, as I said, to me, it should never have been allowed to be installed that way in the first place. If you can do it, here's a good solution. Put a level route at the back of the sidewalk. Surfaces, maybe. Victoria, ask if there's any questions now at this point. This may be a good place to stop for questions. We've got quite a few of them for you, Ron. So I'll just go ahead and get us started off here um, with a combination of a couple. I had one person, and that may have been a rhetorical question, they were asking about why aren't ADAG and PROAG consistent? But there was kind of a, a partner question that went along with this. Um, it says, this may have already been addressed, ADAG versus PROAG. This individual is in Illinois and follows PROAG for all of their work, but they have a um, colleague who started working in Maryland, and in Maryland, the supervisor informed the colleague that Maryland has their own set of guidelines that are less stringent than PROAG and ADAG, um, and they were guessing that maybe some states have grandfathered regulations or exempt in some way, and they want to know if that's accurate and that um, are there states that do not have to meet ADAG? Oh boy, let's, uh, if I don't address all of them, 
holler at me, <laughs> Victoria, but I, I'm not aware of any sort of exemptions or grandfathering or anything like that. Uh, I'm also not aware of how someone could have standards that would be less stringent than PROAG or ADAG. Uh, though under ADA, under the law, those would be the minimum uh, standards as I would interpret them as an engineer to provide accessibility both within buildings and on-site facilities and in the public rights of way. Now certainly, as I just talked about, agencies can exceed that. For example, an agency can say the minimum width will be five feet, whereas PROAG says uh, four. But uh, for example, an agency couldn't say, to my knowledge, in the public right of way, the minimum width is going to be three feet. I mean, there may be provisions, technical infeasibility conditions, where you may have to say to get around a utility pole or a hydrant or something, you may have to have a three foot wide section for a couple feet where, where you have that obstruction in the right of way. But uh, generally, agencies cannot be less stringent than PROAG or ADAG. And I think as far as the difference between them, I don't really know the history, but my, my sort of my understanding is uh, the initial discussions when it came to accessibility was within dealing with buildings or vertical elements, as I believe they're sometimes called. So things like doorways and hallways and uh, entry and exit to a building and restrooms and those, those kinds of things. And then it uh, became obvious, I think, maybe after a few years that, well, this these criteria work well in the sort of in the structure built environment, but they don't work very well in the public right of way environment where you have grades and utilities and uh, vehicles and pedestrians and road users you know, mixing together. And so that's why PROAG was issued is because it's recognized that there are some additional real constraints that exist in the public right of way that may not exist, for example, in a building or, or on a site. Did I touch on most of the, the points there? You did. Did you want to take another one? We'll take another one, yeah. Okay. The next one is, it is my understanding that the curb width can be included in the four foot minimum width if the curb and sidewalk are poured monolithically. Is this correct? Uh, that's one of the gray areas, and I've heard that too as I do my in-person training. Uh, my interpretation would be different. I, I would say that uh, I, I would still not include that curb as part of the four feet. The main reason that's in there is for safety, to provide some margin of safety so that someone in a wheelchair, manual chair, doesn't get too close to the edge or to the vertical face of the curb. So I would still say, and I realize there is no sort of back of curb, if you will, or curb, if it's a monolithic construction, but I would still measure my four feet, I don't know, from say six inches or a foot or so back from the face of the, the curb. But that that is a gray area. And as I said, my basis is for saying that is, is safety to provide some margin of error. Because I've heard people with crutches and braces say the same thing, that they really, they probably could put their crutch or brace tip on the near the edge of curb, but they would prefer not to do that. They'd prefer to have some sort of margin of, of error or safety there so that their crutch tip or cane tip is not right at the curb. Okay, Ron, there's lots of other questions, but we probably need to let you keep going and okay. I'll just read some more off when we get that far and you're ready. Okay. Sounds good. Now we're looking at surfaces. Uh, PROAG is pretty general. It says surfaces should be firm, stable, and slip resistant. So your surfaces are, would typically be concrete, asphalt, uh, maybe sections of wooden, uh, like a boardwalk sort of thing, or a ramp, but those would probably need to have appropriate slip resistance built into them. 
Uh, I've even seen sort of metal plates used, but again, you may have to build, probably would have to build in some, some slip resistance. But things like uh, loose stone, crushed stone, mulch, grass, earth, bare earth, those are not accessible surfaces because the, the surfaces need to be firm and stable, I'd say under all conditions. And I realize you know, bare earth, maybe in midsummer like this, if it hasn't rained for a while, it may be baked pretty hard or even bare earth in northern parts of our country in the winter time when you have sub-freezing temperatures, maybe for weeks at a time, that may be frozen solid. But the point is they won't always be in that condition. You get some thawing or you get some rainfall and that surface then becomes not traversable in a wheelchair. Uh, the PROAC also addresses what they call vertical alignment and also vertical surface discontinuities. Let's take a look at those. How about this? This, this is one of those potential double whammies for a public agency, a local agency. Notice a significant elevation difference there, change in level as it's called. This is a tripping hazard for really all pedestrians, able-bodied pedestrians included, and a pedestrian might trip and fall there and file a personal injury tort claim against the municipality. But also given the magnitude of that elevation difference, someone in a wheelchair probably cannot proceed on that sidewalk. And so it's an inaccessible section of sidewalk and the agency might be subject to an ADA lawsuit. So something like this, obviously try to be repaired pretty quickly, but also uh, certainly should be on the agency's transition plan. But these are tough problems because if you take out the slab and start hacking away at the tree roots, you may endanger the health of the tree as well. So this is one of those areas as well where you may take some creative solutions to, uh, to address the issue. And I mentioned tripping hazard, but as you can see, it can be inaccessible to wheelchair users. Notice how the small front wheel of the wheelchair here is stopped abruptly by that lip there, by that edge, that vertical elevation difference. And in some cases, the person in the chair may actually be catapulted out of the chair onto the pavement or onto the sidewalk and be injured. How about this? Hopefully that's not your community. I think that probably looked great when it was first installed, very attractive, but given time and freeze thaw cycles and weathering and tree growth. In fact, if you look closely, you can almost trace the root system of the, uh, the trees here under that uh, walkway. But now I would contend this is both a safety issue for all pedestrians as well as a, it's not accessible for those with disabilities. So we might think about other solutions. This is what PROAG says about vertical surface discontinuities. That, and PROAG and ADAG are identical in this regard. So for example, in a building at a doorway or something, uh, this same vertical surface discontinuity requirement would apply. The vertical surface discontinuity shall not exceed one quarter inch maximum, as you see here. And this is obviously sort of blown up. Of course, a quarter inch is not, not very much. Those between a quarter and a half inch need to be beveled with a slope not steeper than 50% or two to one across the entire discontinuity. And, and we could do that by, if it's concrete, for example, grinding down the higher elevation, or we could construct a wedge of concrete to create that, that bevel effect. Here are two examples. Uh, of what I was talking about. Here's a concrete wedge. Personally, and I haven't measured this, but to me that looks too steep. I think that looks steeper than the two to one slope. So that would not comply with proang. I think it would be difficult for a wheelchair to get across that. Here the slope looks probably okay, but notice the asphalt is looks like it's disintegrating. So hopefully that is just a temporary repair. And I like to talk about this as the way to handle things. Notice the pedestrian 
path of par is smooth concrete. And then we have, it looks like stamped concrete, but we have coloring and texturing in the furniture zone and over here in the frontage zone. So we, we have the best of both worlds. We have the color and the texture, but the actual travel path is smooth, hard surface, firm, stable, and slip resistant. And I don't know if we've talked about it, but certain individuals in wheelchairs who have various types of spinal cord injuries, for them, when they traverse any sort of surface that's rough or that causes vibration, it can be excruciatingly painful for them. So that is the main reason for this smooth requirement is because it can be very painful. Vibration can be very painful for uh, certain individuals in wheelchairs. Also, we need to be alert to horizontal openings like joints and grates. Uh, notice here, this grate sort of traps the small front wheel of the wheelchair. And again, the same problem we talked about earlier, the individual in that chair may be pitched forward onto the, the sidewalk. And here we see a, a grate. Uh, desirably, of course, these grates should not be in the par, but if, if, if it's necessary, in some cases, it has to be in the par, but we need to pay attention to the grate openings. It looks like here, maybe, maybe the small front wheel of a chair could get in there, maybe not. But in any event, we should also think about what I mentioned a few slides back, individuals with crutches or canes or braces, uh, even though their the assistive device may not, so let's say, fall into these openings, I think you can appreciate how it would affect the bearing. It pre prevents, for example, a cane tip from having like a, a stable bearing on the, uh, the, the, uh, the grate opening there. So we need to be attentive to that. Uh, tree grates desirably should not be in the par, but if they are, we should use the appropriate grate that, that is accessible. It has the smaller openings, has some slip resistance built into it. And uh, notice this would be much preferable to the grate openings that, compared to what I showed you on the previous slide. And here what we're trying to show is the tree grate here would have really expanded the par there to provide greater width. I'm not sure that's four feet where that couple is trying to, to walk. And then I wanted to mention a few words about what are called protruding objects. These are objects that protrude more than four inches into the pedestrian circulation path at a height more than 27 inches, but lower than 80 inches. And those are called protruding objects. And there's a number of examples of them. Here's one, which I think we've all seen. In fact, I've run into, bumped my knees on a few of these over the years. This is a fire department connection kind of sticking out from the fence there, behind the fence, into the sidewalk. It's, it's at about three feet high. You might say, where did these numbers come from? Where did that 27 inches come from? If something is lower than 27 inches, a blind pedestrian with a cane can detect it before they walk into it. If it's higher than 27 inches, they're going to walk into it before they detect it. And so, and I think you can see this would be a real, not so much an accessibility issue, it's really a safety issue. Safety issue for all pedestrians. If a, even if a sighted pedestrian is not paying attention, they can run into that, but especially a blind pedestrian or a low vision pedestrian who has no ability to see that, it becomes a real safety issue. And there's a number of protruding objects, uh, tree branches hanging over a sidewalk, uh, hanging flower baskets in a business district. I think, didn't last week I show you an example of a uh, pole mounted traffic signal controller box. Those can be protruding objects. In older communities where, say, apartments are right up to the sidewalk and the sidewalks are sort of narrow, I've seen window air conditioners in the window. Those are protruding objects. So we need to be alert to these, and if we can't eliminate them, at least try to make them detectable. And here's sort of just for your reference, this is sort of the standard drawing, if you will, that defines a 
protruding object. It's anything that is in this area above the red dashed line or below this red dashed line up here, which is at 80 inches. Anything that extends more than four inches into that space is a protruding object. Notice this is four inch maximum, so that's not a protruding object. If it was, say, six inches, it would be. This obviously extends more than four inches, but it is above 80 inches, so is, is okay. And here, this is protruding well into the space, but notice portion of it is below 27 inches, so it is detectable. And one thing I want to note, PROAG and ADAG are identical on this, that's one thing. But the second thing I wanted to note is that this requirement applies regardless of the width of the sidewalk. Remember for cross slope, we could put in a, say a six foot wide area of level cross slope and the rest of the sidewalk could have a steeper cross slope. Here, because it's really safety related, this requirement applies regardless of the width of the sidewalk. So even if downtown you have say a 30 foot wide sidewalk, there should no, not be any protruding objects even near the storefronts or near, near the street, for example. So that brings us to curb ramps. And I like to talk about the curb ramp conundrum. Let me get all this up here. And I think I mentioned last time that curbs are a good thing for the visually impaired, for the blind. They, they are able to navigate because curbs give them valuable cues. But of course, if someone's in a wheelchair, a curb is a barrier for them. So at a corner, at an intersection, we install curb ramps to remove the barrier. But then notice down here, for this four foot or five foot wide area, the curb is missing. And so it's possible that someone who's blind using the cane could walk right out into the street without realizing it because the curb is missing. So that's why we install the detectable warning surfaces, which we'll talk more about next time. But those, as the slide says, are a replacement cue to the visually impaired to let them know they're about to enter the street. These are the components of the curb ramp. To orient you, the street would be here. And so traffic would be running left to right or right to left here at the bottom of the slide. This area here is a sidewalk, and so pedestrians would be walking right to left or left to right through there. This larger rectangle here in the middle of the slide is the curb ramp itself, the sloped portion. This grayish area is the detectable warning surface at the base of the ramp. And then at the top, we have the landing, or I think the Currently favored word for that, that to describe that space is the turning space because this is where the wheelchairs and individuals with walkers or, for example, braces, this is where they want to do their turning. They want to do their turning on a level turning space, not on a ramp. And I don't know if you noticed it earlier when I was talking about the PAR, I said the flares of a curb ramp are not part of the PAR. So these flares are not part of the pedestrian access route. In other words, it's not envisioned that a pedestrian who just crossed the street coming up this ramp, they are not going to turn across the flare or do this. Or likewise, someone on the sidewalk is not going to come across the flare into the ramp. They're going to use this level turning space. So then you might say, well, why, why do we have this requirement for the flares if they're not part of the PAR? The flares are there simply for the safety of able-bodied pedestrians. And we'll talk briefly about the flare, but that's the reason for the flares is for the safety of able-bodied pedestrians. I mentioned the detectable warnings are the truncated domes. At the base of the ramps, there needs to be a high color contrast for the low vision pedestrian. And notice we have the the truncated dome surfaces here. Uh, they, this is a designed surface. Those domes were designed so that they can be detected with the cane, with the white cane. They're also design, designed to be detected underfoot because I don't know if I mentioned it, I hope I did last week, that uh, 
people who have low vision typically do not use a cane, so they don't have the, that device available. So these have to be de developed or was developed so that these can be detected underfoot or with the cane. So they provide a visual and a tactile cue to the visually impaired. And the rule of thumb is use them anywhere the curb is missing at a street crossing. And we'll talk more about them next time. The curb ramp alignment. Curb ramps ideally should be aligned with the crosswalk to help the wheelchair users orient themselves to cross the street. And I think you can see here on these small radius corners, notice that it's fairly easy to do that. Both sets of ramps here in these two images line up pretty well with the corresponding crosswalk. However, on large radius corners, that's more difficult just due to geometry. The curb ramp needs to be perpendicular to the curb. And so notice here, that here we have two ramps per corner, but notice that due to the geometry, the ramps don't line up ideally with the cross walk, but that's just a function of the, the geometry. Likewise here, this is not a single diagonal ramp. This is the ramp for this crosswalk here. And notice that it doesn't line up well with the, with the crosswalk. Ramp grade, let me get all this up here. The maximum grade is a slope of one in 12 or 8.3%. That's the maximum grade. But again, there's no allowance for construction tolerance, just as there was with cross slope. So uh, agencies, I've, I should keep tabs on it, I guess, but I've seen anywhere from like 6.8 to 7.5%. The slide says 7.1, but uh, agencies will specify something less than 8.3% so that when the ramp is built, it won't be, le it won't be greater than 8.3%. And when you're chasing grade, the running slope length does not have to exceed 15 feet, as you see here. Curb ramp length. This is the formula for curb ramp length. It's the curb height divided by the ramp slope minus the sidewalk cross slope. And our example on this slide is for a six inch curb height. And so if we had a six inch curb height, 8.3% ramp slope, 2% sidewalk cross slope, if we substitute into that formula, we'll come up with a ramp length of 95.24 inches, almost 96 inches, almost eight feet for the ramp. Plus we need four or five foot for our landing or turning space here at the top. And so we're talking about from the back of sidewalk here to the street could be 12 or 13 feet. So obviously these curb ramps uh, require quite a bit of space. Something else to consider is the change of grade or counter slopes. And to orient you here, the uh, just the dark line, we're surrounded by white here below. This is the curb ramp. So here, this is the ramp. The uh, black area here to represent asphalt, I guess, this is the street. So this individual's coming down the ramp and now needs to go up the street cross slope, which becomes a running grade for the person, for the pedestrians in the crosswalk. And notice here, what we're trying to show is that the footrests on the manual chair are actually bottoming out, which is not a good thing. This individual has crossed the street and is now heading up the ramp. And the point is, because of that severe counter slope there, there is the potential that this chair could, could kind of flip over backwards, which is certainly not good. So here's the requirement and then a best practice. So PROAG, if you think they allow an 8.3% ramp grade plus the 5% grade of the crosswalk, that would give you a maximum change of grade of 13.3%. And a best practice, if you can do it, remember this is the best practice, not the requirement, is that if that algebraic 
difference in grade exceeds 11%, put a two foot level area here at the base of the curb ramp. And that makes it, <clears throat> excuse me, makes it a lot friendlier for someone in a wheelchair, makes that grade break or change in grade a lot easier to negotiate. But again, that two foot level area, that is a, a good practice, best practice, that's not the requirement. <clears throat> Curb ramp width, PROAG minimum would be four feet. My advice is the wider ramps are better, so make your curb ramp width the full width of the crosswalk or the sidewalk. Or let's say you have a multi-use trail that's maybe 10 feet wide, paved 10 feet, and your trail crosses a street, the curb ramp should be 10 feet wide. The detectable warning should strip should go across the entire width of that trail or path. Turning space, maybe, maybe Victoria, any questions that we might, maybe a couple that we might take right now? Sure. I think I'm gonna start with the more recent ones and then um, kind of work my way back here. One of them is when Chasing grade, we interpret the 15 foot rule to mean you match the existing at 15 foot and whatever the ramp slope is, it is greater than 8.33%. Is that different than what your figure, Im that is different than what your figure implied, which is correct? Well, let me bear with me, I'm going to back up to that. Yeah, this is saying your ramp grade, the 8.3, can go up to 15 feet. Then you can to catch up with the with the street grade. But yeah, th this grade here, this would be your your 8.3 percent here. I guess I was showing the wrong thing. The ramp grade here, that length does not have to exceed 15 feet. Okay, next one. How would a blind pedestrian know what direction to head when entering the road if the detectable warning strip is not perpendicular to the crosswalk? It seems to make more sense to be perpendicular to the crosswalk than to the curb. Yeah, good question. And let me let me back up a little more here. To We can probably use this one. Yeah, that is one of the issues. And especially, we'll talk about, uh, actually, let me back up one more here. This is what's called a blended transition. We'll talk about these here shortly. But notice here, the detectable warning is all the way around the corner. And this is an acceptable design, in, in, depending on your conditions. But one of the drawbacks of this design is, as the questioner mentioned, notice that there's no guidance, really, no directional guidance to the visually impaired. If they get lined up here, they may walk actually diagonally into the intersection, which is not good. Uh, and this is, let me do another one here. Uh, is we don't have time for it in this uh, webinar, but if anybody's interested, go to the Access Board website and they have a number, they have a set of four videos called uh, I think it's accessible sidewalk design, but one of them shows a blind pedestrian using the cane, and she comes up to a corner like this, and uh, and she's been walking for she's been blind for many many years, so she's an, an experienced blind pedestrian. But she notes in the video that she will tend to stay away from the curb ramp. This is not a good example because this curb ramp is lined up with the crosswalk, but she's learned over the years that the curb ramp may not be lined up with the crosswalk. So what she does, a couple of things. One is she tries to find, and this may not be a good example, but she tries to find the, uh, the tangent portion here where it's not on a, a curve alignment to make her crossing. Or she also explains in that video how she listens carefully for traffic sounds. And apparently, again, I said she's an experienced 
blind pedestrian, so she's many years of experience, but she is able to use the traffic sounds of traffic on the parallel street to kind of line herself up with the crosswalk. I Personally, I found that pretty amazing, but uh, I'm, she demonstrates it in the video. So, I mean, obviously she's developed that skill, but of course that begs the question, you know, what do you, this looks like a busy four lane arterial, but at the time this image was taken, there's not much traffic there. So what do you do then if there's no traffic noise to, because traffic noise is a good thing for blind pedestrians. That that's, helps them navigate and keep a straight path. But what if there is no traffic noise? But yeah, that, that is an issue. And uh, other than what I, I said, I'm not sure what else to say. It, it is something that the, the blind pedestrian needs to be aware of and, and is aware of and tries to compensate for. Maybe can we get back to the slides and then we'll- Yep, sounds good. Up. I'm at the end for questions. Let me catch up to where we were here. Okay, turning space. It's the level area at the top of the ramp where individuals in wheelchairs or with walkers or with crutches or braces do their turning to enter the ramp. And notice the slide says a minimum four foot by four foot turning space shall be provided at the top of the ramp. Uh, there's two conditions that exist with turning spaces. One is what's called unconstrained. The other is called constrained. The image or the photo you see here is an unconstrained condition. And by that, I mean, notice the grass here is at essentially the same elevation as the sidewalk. So if I'm in a manual chair and I come across the street here and I go, come up the ramp, my the footrests on my wheelchair can go out over that grass that's what we mean by an unconstrained condition and in that case that turning space can be four feet by four feet but now let's imagine instead of grass here let's imagine there's a eight inch high curb and behind that curb is a bed of flowers or something like that some landscaping now that eight inch high curb at the back of the sidewalk here prevents my footrest, the footrests on my wheelchair from going over the grass. Or imagine there's a storefront here, a building. That is called a constrained condition. And in a constrained condition, the turning space needs to be at least five feet in the direction of travel. So everybody clear on that, that four by four that's in the text of the slide there applies to an unconstrained condition. If it's a constrained condition, if there's some obstacle or a wall or a storefront or something at the back of that sidewalk, that's a constrained condition. And in that case, there needs to be a minimum of five feet in the direction of travel. Turning spaces are critical. This image doesn't do justice to the degree of difficulty and exertion that it takes someone in a wheelchair to turn while they're going up a grade. And notice that individual's wearing gloves, not so much because it's cold, but because of the wear and tear on the palms of their hands making that maneuver. And the same thing applies to someone with crutches or in the final years of his life, my dad used a walker, two wheels on the front and the skids on the back, and he had the same issue. So really, Anybody who's using any sort of mobility assistive device, they really need a level turning space. And again, I hate to keep saying it, but if you ever get a chance to get in a manual wheelchair, and I encourage all of you to do it whenever you can, just so you get a better feel for some of these challenges and issues, try to do this, get in a manual wheelchair and try to go up a ramp and turn at the same time, especially a ramp like this that looks like it, it's steeper than 8.3%. But I would advise if you do it, make sure you have a spotter behind you and on your side because you may very well get to about this point and just roll back into the street or, or your chair could even tip over. So this is not, as I said, this still static slide does not do justice to the degree of difficulty associated with that maneuver. And details are important. I always say details, details, details. This looks like a fairly new ramp and turning space, but notice the hydrant here 
makes this kind of non-functional as a turning space. PROAG also says the bottom of a curb ramp must have a four foot by four foot clear space entirely outside the parallel vehicle travel lane and within the crosswalk. And notice a single diagonal ramp does not meet that requirement. And I also want to emphasize this is clear space. It's just space. It does not have to be level does not have to have a 2% cross slope. There just has to be four foot by four foot clear space entirely outside the parallel vehicle travel lane and within the crosswalk at the bottom of the ramp. I mentioned the flares earlier. The requirement is that the flares are not to be steeper than 10% measured parallel to the curb. And again, to repeat, this requirement is there for the safety of able-bodied pedestrians. It really has nothing to do with accessibility. Where you don't have a pedestrian circulation path crossing the ramp, you can use vertical curb returns. So notice here on both sides of the ramp is just the grass strip, the furniture zone. So there, we don't anticipate pedestrians walking across the ramp, and so we can use a vertical curb return here. And here's an example, not the best example, it lacks detectable warning surface here, but notice this is a fairly wide uh, furniture zone or tree lawn, whatever we want to call it here, and so we can put in a vertical curb return. And think about it, to, to show the interaction of these things with different users will vary. Uh, would you agree that if you were a blind pedestrian using a cane, you'd probably prefer the vertical curb returns because this is more detectable than a flared side. But if I'm in a wheelchair, I may be concerned about what if two of my wheels or one of my wheels gets up here, is my chair going to tip over? So there's there's pluses and minuses for all these designs, depending on the user, if you will. Another issue that comes up with curb ramps is drainage. Probably everywhere I've gone around the country to do training, I see a curb ramp that has water ponded at the bottom. Or of course, in the winter time in Northern climates, that may turn to ice, which then presents safety and accessibility issues. Of course, the textbook solution, as it the, says there in the slide, place inlets upstream of the ramps. The reality is we can't always do that, but we should try to pay attention to drainage to try to prevent that standing water at the base of the ramp. Surfaces. The surfaces of both these ramps comply with PROAG. But the better design, the best practice is to make the surfaces of ramps and turning spaces a smooth surface. I mean, I know this maybe looks nice, but to, to try to go up a uh, textured ramp and to turn, and there doesn't look to be much of a turning space here, but to turn is much more difficult than it is on a smooth surface like you see here, the smooth ramp and then the smooth turning space. And again, if you don't believe me on that, I urge you to try that yourself in a chair and you can demonstrate for yourself that a smooth ramp is much easier to go up and to make turns on the turning space than a textured ramp or turning space. So my advice to designers is to, again, keep that travel path, the sidewalk, the turning spaces, the ramps, smooth surface, smooth hard surface, and any color or texturing Put that outside the uh, car. So let's look at the types of sidewalk to street transitions. There's actually three of them. There's two types of curb ramps. There's perpendicular ramps and parallel ramps. And then the second type of sidewalk to street transition I mentioned a little while ago is the blended transitions. Perpendicular curb ramps, we have two per corner. As you see here, they need a turning space at the top. If they're in the pedestrian circulation path, they need a flares on the side. 
And I mentioned earlier, the curb ramps have to be perpendicular to the curb so that both wheels of the manual chair enter and leave the ramp at the same time. Here's, hopefully you don't have any ramps like this. I'll call this a skewed ramp. Notice the ramp is not perpendicular to the curb. And if you look closely down here in the photo, notice the small front wheel of that wheelchair is off the ground. And recall I said when that happens, the stability of that chair is jeopardized. It could easily tip over. So we don't want that to happen. For perpendicular ramps, the cross slope, which would mean the slope in this direction, which would also be the cross slope of the crosswalk, is given here. As published right now in PROAG in the 2011 edition, notice it's a function of the traffic control on the roadway being crossed here. If the roadway is stop or yield controlled, the maximum cross slope is 2%. If it's signalized, uncontrolled, or a mid-block crossing, the cross slope of the crosswalk and of the ramp can match the street grade. But it's expected that when the final version of PROAG is signed into law, there'll be a slight difference. Notice if stop or yield control will still be 2% maximum. If it's signalized or uncontrolled, 5% maximum. And for mid-block crossings, the cross slope of the crosswalk can match the street grade. And I'll emphasize this would be for new construction, for new construction. But think about it, this will probably affect the way we design intersections. We sort of need to table the uh, intersection so that the cross slopes in the vicinity of the crosswalks comply with these criteria. So perpendicular ramps, they're probably the least likely to pond and trap sediment. The user has some setback from traffic while they're waiting to cross. But as I mentioned earlier, they are difficult to provide, or it's difficult to provide a good path of travel on large radius corners, and they also take up a lot of space. So the second type of curb ramp is the parallel curb ramp. And notice here, we drop the turning space basically to street level and we ramp down to that turning space. And these, one of the advantages of a parallel curb ramp is they do fit in constrained locations. Notice the slide says a minimum four by four foot turning space at the bottom of the ramp. That minimum applies to an unconstrained condition. And I don't want this slide to mislead anybody. Notice here at the back of the sidewalk is a little curb or retaining wall. This is a constrained condition. So in this case, from the back of the curb to that wall or that curb, face of this curb, needs to be a minimum of five feet because that's a constrained condition. And everyone clear on that? Notice it's measured from the back of the curb, not from the back of the detectable warning. The detectable warning is part of that turning space, which is not the best because we have a rough surface that can induce vibration as part of the uh, turning space and as part of the sidewalk if pedestrians are not crossing the street. But given this design, that, that's the nature of the, of the beast, if you will. These are the cross slope requirements for parallel curb ramps and the associated crosswalks. They're identical to what I just presented a few minutes ago, so I'm not going to repeat that, but I'll emphasize again this is for new construction. So, parallel curb ramps fit within narrow right of way. To me, that's their biggest advantage. Uh, the disadvantages are. Users continuing along the sidewalk have to negotiate ramp grades, but perhaps to me the biggest disadvantage is that we have to pay careful attention to that bottom turning space because uh, you may get water and debris and sediment 
accumulating there that may actually even in extreme cases can cover the detectable warnings and make the turning space almost non-traversable because it's it's just a area covered with sand or sediment. And then the third type of sidewalk to street transition is the blended transitions, which I mentioned earlier. Notice a couple things. Notice the running slope is 5% maximum, not 8.3%. And notice also that we don't need a turning space. And this is the cross slope requirements, which is similar to what we just talked about. So with a blended transition, the curb is missing around this entire corner. I think I have some graphic examples here. So we don't need a turning space. The disadvantage is that uh, people, especially children or the visually impaired, may not distinguish the street edge. Notice here, this is not a detectable warning. This is just, or a curb, it's just like a white strip of concrete here. The, the point is this plaza and the street are at the same elevation. So a blind pedestrian can go out in the street without realizing it. Better design is to notice how they have these ground mounted planters here to force pedestrians to the apex of the corner. And then we have detectable warning all the way around here. One of the disadvantages of a blended transition though is that because so much of the curb is missing, sometimes motorists mistake this area for a driveway or an intersecting road and they may actually turn onto the sidewalk, which is clearly not a good thing. So sometimes you may see in situations like this, and it's shown here, a bollard is installed to keep out motor vehicles. But as many of you are probably aware, bollards are a serious fixed object hazard for bicyclists. And so again, it's trying to balance all of our users. So blended transitions do have some disadvantages, but it's recognized that in some cases, they may be the only design that really fits or is technically feasible in a particular or at a particular street corner. Notice I have not mentioned the diagonal or single curb ramp. And the reason for that is shown in red here. These are unacceptable in new construction. So we should not be building any more new single diagonal ramps unless, well, it may be okay for alterations if it's technically infeasible to use one of the other three designs. And we've talked some of the reasons why. Notice this does not give good guidance for the visually impaired. If they do get lined up with the crosswalk, they, we're sending them diagonally into the intersection. Also notice how the wheelchair user here He's been crossing from the top of the slide here toward the bottom. And to get to the ramp, he has to go out of the protection of the crosswalk. And think about it, his back is to traffic where he can't keep an eye on it. And that's very disconcerting. So he's out of the crosswalk with his back to traffic to try to get in there. But think about it, and I've seen this on some streets uh, in my travels, where a mom pushing a child in a stroller has to do the same thing. She's out of the protection of the crosswalk with her back to traffic, pushing the stroller toward her and up the ramp. So it's just not, not a good situation. Combination ramps here. Notice we ramp down to a level turning space at the top of the curb ramp here. And we have a ramp section here. And here's another location ramping down here and here to the turning space. And then we have a curb ramp. And notice here, one side of the ramp has a vertical curb return because this is a landscaped area. I guess that's desert landscaping, but this is not a pedestrian circulation area. Here we do have a pedestrian circulation area. So the ramp is, is flared here. It looks steeper than 10%, but if you look closely, it looks like there's a utility cover there. So hopefully they have a technical infeasibility or an exception documented there of why that might not comply with the requirements. 
So we have a few minutes left. I'd like to leave some time for questions, but let me go through some curb ramp examples just to share with you my thoughts. Uh, hopefully this is not your community, but I guess there are some where we still do have corners with, without curb ramps. But let's imagine this municipality is gonna resurface one of these streets later this summer. And so they realize under Kinney versus Jerusalem, which we talked about last week, they need to make sure they have compliant curb ramps on all corners. So here is a design that they came up with. I realize it looks a little steep, but assuming everything would comply, notice this is sort of a combination ramp. They're ramping the sidewalk down to a level turning space, same thing over here. And this turning space serves both ramps, which is fine, there's not an issue with that. And so we have a ramp here and a ramp here. And to me, that looks, looks okay, assuming it's 8.3% grade maximum, four foot width, 2% cross slope, that should be okay. Here's a different city, a different street corner. Uh, notice that here we have a single diagonal ramp at 9%. And notice here on the left, notice you see some alligator cracking, it looks like some potholes developing. Let's imagine that, uh, let's say next summer, this community is going to repave this street because of the poor pavement condition. And they recognize that a 9% slow or grade on a single diagonal ramp does not comply with current PROAG criteria. So on this corner and probably all four corners here, they're going to have to install compliant curb ramps. And so, they let's say they retained a consultant and this is the design that came back except hopefully the signal pole here is not in the middle of the sidewalk let's assume that's in the grass <laughs> but this is the design notice similar sort of thing they're ramping down to a level turning space here and then the sidewalk wraps around the corner and then we have the turning space and then we ramp back up to the sidewalk And the, I guess, I mean, this would be probably okay with or without the retaining wall. It's probably more a function of the geotechnical conditions here, the soil conditions. If, if that soil is stable just on a natural slope, you probably wouldn't need this retaining wall, but they have a retaining wall there, which is fine. That's detectable. And to me, this looks okay from a PROAG standpoint. It appears to be compliant. But as a traffic engineer, I think about some other issues. Notice, for example, where will the stop line be for motor vehicle traffic here? It's gonna be way back, back here somewhere. Also notice that if a pedestrian's crossing here in the lower left, a driver making that right turn may not be expecting or may not clearly see a pedestrian crossing here. And also notice that pedestrians say on this sidewalk that goes into the background, they have to do some out of direction travel to get to the crosswalk. And I don't know about you all, but maybe it's because I live here in a university city where I am in Morgantown, West Virginia, but we have a few locations like this in town. And if I watch our able-bodied, you know, young 18 to 20 year old, 22 year old college students, we have a number of these, they will just cross they won't go out of direction, they'll cross out of the crosswalk. So this may not be the best design. So actually they went back to the de designer and said, can you come up with a, another alternative? And this is the one that the designer came up with. Notice now there's no out of direction travel. Now we have one turning space that's at the base of the ramps that come down here. Uh, and that serves both ramps. And now the stop line on both roadways can be at a more conventional location. I think driver visibility of pedestrians is better. So personally, I like this design compared to the other one. The other one, again, I wanna emphasize, met PROAG requirements, but it may not have been as safe as it could have been. And remember, we, in my opinion, from what I said last week, we, we need to consider safety 
in that uh, in our designs as well. And I don't know if you can see what they're doing here. This is sort of a variable height curb here, a little hump or ridge in the, the concrete here. Uh, and because there is a curb height here, the visually impaired should not be able to enter the street. Someone with a cane can detect that curb height. Uh, someone once said in another class, live class that I did, could we put grass or ground cover in here? And yeah, you could do that. Personally, I think that might be a maintenance issue. So I think the concrete might be best, but there's a number of different ways that that could be handled. And I think I have one more example. Uh, this is a West Virginia example. Imagine this street is going to be resurfaced. This is one corner. This is looking south. This is standing at the top of the, or standing near the utility pole, actually. This is the view. Notice there's no sidewalk on this side of the street or along this roadway, nor is there on the other side. And I apologize for the quality of this image. I, one of the problems, of course, with small towns is the Google imagery may be old. So this is from like 2008, it's not the best quality. But what I wanted to show here is this corner in the summertime, uh, notice not only is there no sidewalk, but I mean, the vegetation actually almost hangs over the sidewalk. So it's kind of a blind corner there. So what I wanted to do, try to do it quickly so we can answer some questions, is just share with you my thoughts for this Corner. Not that I have the right answer or the only answer. You all may have uh, even better responses, but I just want to share with you my thoughts. So my thought is, notice here, I mean, one question that came up last time is, to, should we have a curb ramp here? There's no sidewalk on the other side of the street. Uh, firstly, if, if, if there was no sidewalk here and there was good sight distance, I probably would put in a ramp here. We'd have to put in a probably some sort of switchback arrangement, but I probably would put in a ramp. But given here, personally, I wouldn't want an able-bodied pedestrian walking in the road here, let alone uh, someone with an impairment or visually impaired or something. So in my opinion, for safety reasons, I would not have a ramp here. In fact, I would remove this this step arrangement and just fill that in with grass. That's grass is detectable. So the visually impaired would know not to proceed. And then we'd have to do some little bit of earthwork. We'd probably have to raise the sidewalk here, and maybe lower this a little bit to get rid of those, this, that stair and a half or whatever that is there. But I'd make this just a ramp compliant with pro I get ramped connection around here. And uh, I would not even put in a a curb ramp. And down the block, there is an intersection with more favorable terrain. And so there you can have curb ramps. So someone could get to the other side of the street. There is a small block back here, but that's kind of the city limits then. There's really no more pedestrian destinations beyond that point. But anyway, any questions? We've got a ton, but I'm only going to ask you one, which I think a lot of people would like to know the answer to. Where can an organization or municipality obtain the most up-to-date ADA curb ramp design specifications? The most up-to-date would be the, uh, I would say the PROAG website, which is one of the links in the uh, resource list that you all were provided with last week. Uh, the other thing I would say too is probably is if your state DOT has adopted PROAG, uh, you might look at their standard drawings and things. But I would say make sure your agency has adopted PROAG since then they should be consistent with PROAG, but perhaps get into some more you know, different conditions above and beyond what you'd find in PROAG. Sounds great. Thank you, Ron. We've only got one minute left, so I will make certain to follow up with everybody with that resource document in addition to the handouts that were in today's um, handout panel. And I will be sending all of your questions over to Ron. Um, he'll probably have lots of reading for the whole afternoon with what's been coming in. So, Ron, is there anything else you wanted to add? 
No, just to say thank you, everyone, for participating and your good questions, and we'll see everyone tomorrow morning. Absolutely. We'll see everyone then. Thank you.